Evan Hughes. Hey. The, the amazing Evan Hughes. Jeremy, thank you for having me, man. You're welcome. <laughs> it's exciting. We're in your living room. This is my living We're room. We're living. I, and you do not have a lack of work <laughs> of art on your walls. Thank you. I see lips. I see movie posters. I see all kinds of stuff. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to kind of dive into your mind, Evan's mind, <laughs> which is a very interesting place, I'm sure. Uh, early on, early life, we're going to hop around here, but do how are you doing today? I'm Everything doing well? fantastic. I do want to comment on my house. So I think the style is a lot of the super, super like weird shit is mine. And then my <laughs> girlfriend's is the more like granny style. Stuff. Okay. <laughs> you know, so but granny it, meets uh, the weird, the weird, it uh, goes well together though. I don't know why it just, it works. It you does. Know? Just it like does she work. and I work. And we're here in the Heights, uh, obviously right bordering downtown. You said you live here before we got on here. You lived here since 2018. That's right. Obviously you love it here. Uh, speaking of loving it, dude, I see we just <laughs> were talking about how much, Tulsa loves you and you love Tulsa. You grew up here. Mm -hmm. Let's dive in early Memorial days. You said you went to Memorial oh, high yeah. school. Oh yeah. How was the public school system? How was, oh. how was the upbringing? <laughs> how was the upbringing of heaven use? Oh man. I, you know, I was so shy. I was one of those people in high school. that didn't talk like okay. that was me in high school. It took me so long to like get comfortable with myself and just to break out of my shell, you know, and people wanted me to talk. I just wouldn't, I just had that deep fear of, Everything. I was scared of everything. Like when I look back, I was like, I was terrified. Oh, really? Yeah. Like I ran into, um, I don't know if you know Tim Todd, but I went to high school with Tim Todd and he was like, man, you were so cool in high school. And I was like, <laughs> I was scared to talk. I must, maybe I seemed cool because I was like silent, but um, no, it was, I didn't feel cool. Mm. You know, would, would you say that? So maybe I'm gathering just like quiet guy in the corner. I was assuming going into this, you're like, you were the clown. No, I was actually a heavy metal guy in high school. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I wore band shirts every single day. Okay. Uh, I, I had long hair. I dyed my hair black. And I was I was more like, oh, we don't know about him. But I was like, I was more comfortable with that because I was like, I can't have a conversation with you even if we do end up talking. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you were afraid of like people like interacting with people or I think so. I think it was like, you know, even like the girl I had a crush on in high school, like I could never talk to her. You know, I couldn't I could hardly talk. I just, you know. My best friend, we would kind of sit there at lunch and only say like, you know, four or five words to each other. You know, I was just one of those people. Like, I think you could see those kids. You could see those high schoolers. Sure, sure. You know, but it doesn't mean they'll be like that forever. Sure, sure. You know? So if you're worried about your kid and you're like, oh, my God, my kid doesn't talk like when they're 45, they might be talking a <laughs> When they're my age. When yeah. did you feel like that wasn't as big of a factor? Is it just living life? Uh, did you go to college? Like after high school, as you started developing maybe who you were as a when you got to know yourself a little bit better, when did you start feeling like I'm, 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 I have a voice here and I have, I have this itch and it could be comedy or whatever. Like when did you start to get those maybe confident boosters? It took about like 14 years. Honestly, okay. I had like kind of wasted my whole twenties just like that, like just like high school. And, um, I think when I was like 34, I was like, fuck this. I was like, I just, I remember I was sitting at my computer one day and I was just like, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, I'm like going to get out and I found a concert to go to and I just went there by myself and then I, I felt great. And I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this. You know, because at that concert, I felt like even though um, I wasn't with people, I felt like the joy of others, like being in proximity of other people's joy and it kind of filled me up and it was like, a feeling I hadn't had in there in years. Hmm. And I was like, oh, my, I got to get more of this. So like proximity, like to a community. At yeah. the time you didn't have a community, you're like, I got to get out. I have to experience life. And you were like going to, was it a Canes show? Like what, what was that early? Yeah, I think it was a Canes. It was either Canes or Marquee okay. or Vanguard. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's, so you had a developmentally, it was just late. Yeah. And I think just like, there's something about like, watching everything on the screen, whether you're like watching everything on your phone or your computer or your TV, at some point you're like, I want to experience this for real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, were you, would you say you're like rooted in, in nerdology? Like, were you a nerd? I mean, you say computer, are you just a gamer? Like, let's get into this. That's the funny thing I've been called out on before because I always classified myself as a nerd. Okay. But then when people would be like, well, what about this Pokemon or what about this or what about that? Or like, you know, comic books and I don't know about it. They're like, 
you're really more of a dork than a nerd because you're like a nerd maybe that doesn't know time. shit. Maybe this is a good time to <laughs> maybe distinguish what is a nerd and what is a dork. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have the, if you don't actually spend your time, like I loved music, music, I loved music even more than comedy. You know, I never played an instrument, but that was kind of like, I was more of a record collector in okay. music. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So were you in the band in high school? Uh, no, 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 okay. no. See, I, that's one thing about, about me that I always tell people. I never had a talent. You know, like I wasn't good at drawing. I couldn't play an instrument. I couldn't sing. I couldn't play sports. And so I was like, man, I, that was kind of a frustrating part of my life, too, I think, where I was like, I'm not good at anything. Like I had friends that were like, oh, he's a car guy. And you could easily describe, like, the thing they're good at. And I didn't have that. And comedy was, like, the first thing that I ever got, like, compliments on. Oh. And so like, I was like, oh, you're my God. funny. Yeah, I was like, thing. I found my thing. Huh. Yeah. And when was that? That was after, well, it was really after my first set at, at Looney Bin. I got, I got that like a little bit, but I didn't really believe it. And then when I did my second show, I heard it even more and people were actually like, fit, like patting me on the back and stuff. And I actually like felt like, oh, that, that was good, you know? So let's dive into comedy. I would say you're, you're, that's what a lot of people know you for. Either yeah. they've seen you at Blue Whale or you've done a lot of shows around town. You had just mentioned you're now traveling and doing other things and shows. You said Kansas City? Yeah, I was in Kansas City this last uh, Saturday doing a Don't Tell comedy show. Okay. And Kansas City was okay. great. Do you feel like there's a lot of momentum now in, in what you're doing? Now you're starting to be recognized more for comedy. And do you feel like a big momentum there or do you feel like it's always been kind of an underlying thing? Yeah, I think I got in a little bit ahead of the curve where like comedy kind of became this like everybody talks about doing five minutes now or everybody's done an open mic or whatever. But when I started in, in 2015, it hadn't quite hit a trendy place or it was in a it was kind of in a down down cycle. So I think I was there and helping, you know, build it when people started being aware of it and they were like, well, this is the guy doing it. So and then I, I think I, I handled it in a good way where I was just always encouraging of like. I'll help you get in. I'll help you get in. I'll help you get in instead of like gatekeeping it. I love that. And would you say not to get too much into your routine and, and, and com the comedy side, but uh, are you a routine guy? Like, do you have like a set? I, I, I find it. I find comedy fascinating because to the naked eye, most people, or maybe now they're more educated, but you would think someone's just hopping up there, just telling jokes. It's just like flipping things. There's a real science to yeah. comedy there's there's a real setup and 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 punchline and and obviously as i'm speaking i'm like oh you're an idiot jeremy like you don't even know what you're talking about <laughs> how was early comedy and how have you honed that over the years well like i feel like when i first started uh, all my comedy was kind of being written in this you know specific box kind of because it takes you a while to really develop your style and your voice and really like it's kind of like being a band where it's like all of your early songs are like three chords pop punk and then it's like by the third album you're like a super weird band <laughs> you know so the comedy was a yeah, lot like that for yeah. me so it's like now i have basically i feel like i have albums and so like the, like the show i did in kansas city for example i wrote out like a set list beforehand and um i've been doing it long enough where it's like i probably you know in my first couple of years i would have been you know freaking out about it and i would have memorized the set list you know two weeks in advance you know but for this show i was kind of like doing it in the green room before it started, you know? And then, you know, when I'm on stage, it's like, oh, okay, I'm just, where are we going with this thing? You know, so I'm just pulling out stuff that wasn't on the set list. And I'm like, that joke's five years old, but it's probably gonna work, and here it is. And then I get off stage and I'm like, well, I, I did these like I expected. I didn't do these, right? And then I did these ones for some reason, you know? And it's just <laughs> like, that's comedy. <laughs> and, do you, and do you find that, based on feedback from audience, is how you pivot? And saying, you know what, I if that played really well, I'm getting some really good laughter. I'll get some feedback here. Let's pivot and do this now because I feel like that. Or, or is that just where your mind goes? Is like, oh, he, I should do this next. Like, how do you make that transition in that meandering through your set? Yeah, I think um, I think there is something there where like if you go into like, okay, let me try a, more, a darker joke, and they really like it, then it's like you might as well do all of your darker jokes because that's what they're they're biting. But um, I I feel like I I haven't had that happened to me in a while where I kind of feel more like confident in myself and my my set and my stuff where I'm kind of like even if they don't like something that much I'm probably it's probably not going to completely derail hmm. what I'm doing you know yeah what I mean? yeah yeah, but, I, yeah. But I've been in that ex in that situation before where it's like 
oh, I got to scrap these songs and play these songs. Got it. Thing. Got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How would you describe the Tulsa scene when it comes to comedy, comics, maybe specifically? Uh, do we have a healthy scene here? Do, do we, could we use more venues? What's going on here in Tulsa? I think we're getting even more venue offers than we can quite even handle right now, which is, which is really amazing because there's places you wouldn't even think of that you wouldn't think that place would have comedy. And then they, they'll reach out to us and they're like, we're interested in having a comedy night. And you're like, you guys want a comedy night, <laughs> you know, like give me one of those, like yeah. what a venue that was like, what in the world? Well, it's been pretty cool. We did one at the aquarium out in Jinx. Which That's is, super which cool. Which is really neat. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to name one where I turned them down. But <laughs> <laughs> but we did the we did the aquarium. We're going to do that kind of, I think, like quarterly. Okay. Uh, we got Was this out. like a fundraiser type of thing for the aquarium? Or they just have they a just want They just want to do some, do some shit. Dude, that's awesome. That's yeah. super cool. And the see. Summit Club. Yeah. Obviously, which is like a place where you're like, ooh, I don't think we'll ever be able to get in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or it's just nothing, yeah. nothing personal. It's sure. just like, what use would they have for us? You right. know what I mean? Right. And I think just the... The longer we've grinded at this thing and the more traction we've gotten, people have taken notice and they're like, it's fine to have those guys in here because it's not going to be a bunch of bad reviews. They're not going to break a window. Sure. I wouldn't necessarily liken you guys to like a rough crowd. Maybe I'm like, a, or maybe, maybe you've gotten that. I don't know. Well, I think over the years it's like it, it, people could assume that. I mean, sure. cause you just don't sure. really know you're like comedy and they could think <laughs> of like the worst thing you would ever right. associate with comedy. Right. So it's something like, it's a real wait and see, but I think at this point where people are like, well, the Philbrook does something, you know, the aquarium does, the summit club does it. At some point it's like any Tulsa inst institution is probably going to feel safe. Sure. Cause they're good word of mouth. Sure. And I think that's what, what we've really got. What's the best venue in Tulsa? Like what's the best, like from what I understand with comedy, having like a, a closed room, like having a tight, like I want to say shoulder to shoulder, but like having that, that, um, I don't know, that feel of maybe, uh, I don't know. I don't know. The, the idea here is like a, a tight, very unique space, uh, something that's not outside, something indoors, that sort of, I mean, what has the best place like that? In, in I, I love lowdown okay. for okay. comedy yep. just because it's like, it's like a hundred people and it's kind of, it's kind of classy, but it's like a no windows kind of sure. like, you know, like comedy cellar in New York. It's like underground in a basement. It's just that their equipment's the best. I mean, you can't really complain about it. If you don't do well there, that's on you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so vibes, I guess that's what I'm, yeah. you have a certain level of how many times have you, have you performed at lowdown? Uh, probably like 10 times or okay. something like oh, that. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I help, I help book it, but I don't always have myself on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. We, before we started, obviously speaking of lowdown, uh, Blue Whales right around the corner. Yeah, super excited. And we're excited because we're involved with that as Labor Division side. But we're also excited because there's a lot of cool comics coming to Tulsa for yeah. this. You've been a part of it for how many years now? Let me see. So I started in 2015. Um, I didn't apply my first year, but I was offered a spot. And then I took off one year because I was kind of like I had just been – I really went you didn't need to know all this but there was a pandemic year sure there's, there's but i've been involved for most of blue whale okay yeah. okay <laughs> would you say that's one of the better things that happens like to tulsa like coming to tulsa or oh yeah re for rooted sure here on the yeah comic there would like tulsa tough and all that stuff yeah, yeah i mean i think blue whale i think next year is going to be it's 10 years yes so that's crazy i mean it's been yes. like i think it's been a little bit under the radar at times but it's like everybody that actually goes is like, holy shit. Yeah. And when I, I tell you the people that came, it's like, yeah, Nate Bargatze played in the Majestic and Nikki Glaser yep. played at the first shop back at the back patio stage. Um, Tony Hinchcliffe played at Inner Circle Vodka Bar in the main room. Eric, like An big Eric name. Andre yes. did Canes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them were like not as big as they ended up getting. You know, it's like obviously Nate Bargatze's done the BOK Center sure, now. Sure. But it's like, yeah, he was in the fucking Majestic. You know, Dude, that's <laughs> wild. This is sick. And I think yeah. this year has the possibility for like that same effect. I mean, Michael Longfellow is going to be around a long time. You know, he's an SNL cast member now. He's 30 years old. He He's going to get bigger. Who else do we have? Oh, uh, Reggie Watts. I mean, obviously yep. Reggie. Yep. Um, Casey Rocket, who is just rocketing you know um, don't make that a clip <laughs> <laughs> but um you know what i mean yeah, uh, this is, yeah there's a lot of them that i think johnny pemberton's getting bigger all the yeah. time yeah. he was just in um a fallout uh-huh 
you know, the show is yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. For sure. For yeah. sure. And he's going to be in two shows. Is that the goal here is, is for you personally is that's, that's your trajectory. Like you're wanting to head in that direction of like becoming a bigger and bigger comic. I think, you know, I feel like I am on the same trajectory as Tulsa in a lot of ways where it's like Tulsa's getting bigger and I'm going with Tulsa. Okay. You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I do think like, I mean, if Tulsa ever hits this kind of like critically insane moment in the country, like I'll be right there. Okay. You know, okay. but I don't think I'm like outpacing or trying to leave Tulsa. I'm trying to do this with the community. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I sitting down here and chatting with you, I don't know why I'm thinking you seem like an unbelievable writer. Are you a writer? By, uh, I like, consider, yeah. you know, I consider myself a writer. I like, haven't tried, I haven't tried to write a book or anything, but well, yeah. no, I, I'm not thinking I know about like a mean. novel or anything. I'm, I'm thinking like, like hopping on and, and doing like SNL skit. Right. I know there's, there's lots of different writers within Hollywood or whatever of, of comedic needing comedic juice, let's say. And I just find I, I sitting here, I'm just getting that vibe. So maybe, maybe that's not the path for you. <laughs> you know, a guy from Tulsa writes on Saturday Night Live. I did not know that. Yeah. Stephen King. Okay. Yeah, it's Stephen Castillo now, but yeah, yeah he's yeah. from Tulsa. Dude, I had no idea. Yeah. He started off in the Tulsa comedy. So, scene so he just does it long distance is just like, no, I think he, lives out, he lives out in Manhattan. And oh everything. wow. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. He's been on a right. He's been for years. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. That's and really also cool. like there was an episode I think where he had a sketch that he'd written for the show and was on the show and Bill Hader from Tulsa was sure. hosting. So it was like, Tulsa was like represented on. SNL. Yeah. Yeah. Represented. Yeah. That's really cool. We had mentioned, uh, well, this whole conversation centers around this lovely lit city that we're living in Tulsa. Uh, you're from Tulsa, born and raised. You talked about the growth of Tulsa. Where in your opinion is Tulsa going? Why are you excited to be in this city? I have my own thoughts here, but I'd love to hear from you of of why have you stayed here? Why do you believe in this city? I think it's I think it's going to a great place. I mean, I'm I'm for I'm for pretty much everything that's happening in it, really. I mean, it's it's growing, you know. I mean, I think people find thing find ways to complain about anything. Sure. You know, so I think um if Tulsa wasn't moving at all, I think that would be that would be bad, you know. So I, I love the growth, you know, and I think more and more people are moving here. Uh, there's Tulsa remote, but there's also people moving here, not Tulsa remote. So I meet people all the time. They're great people. And they just got here like this last year. So I think it's funny because people talk about like, oh, well, we don't want to have the end up with the problems that Austin got or the problems that these places got, you know, but I think um, I don't think we're, we're we have to worry about that yet. You mentioned Austin. We've been compared to Austin for forever, yeah. forever. And I think deep down, it's either that or OKC. And we're like, OK, enough. Like, let's yeah. just, I, I think it's, what's, what's those t-shirts that someone had some, like, let's just, let's be Tulsa and not anyone else, that sort of thing. You also mentioned, um, which I find very interesting is the haters is like, they're finding problems with the roads or problems with whatever. And I specifically went down this dark hole and it's, it's, it's been a while now, <laughs> but like last year to six months of just hate, just, just spewed on Facebook or on all these platforms, these social media platforms of what the gathering place is doing or what the city is doing or this, that, whatever. And it just, it, to be honest with you, it just starts to annoy me because mm -hmm. I'm by, tr by, by, by nature, I'm a very positive person. And at some point in time, the negativity of people really is just like, dude, just, just find the, the positive in this. Everyone's, I mean, no offense to anybody, but they're not happy with the way the bridge turned out. Speaking mm -hmm. of over mm -hmm. there off, uh, like right there. And, and, and we're about to have this big party celebrating this. And I, I love it because the city is, is still trying to do their best at the end of the day. It might not be exactly what everyone anticipated, but like Tulsa is still doing great things. And I've, I've kind of, I'm on this little rant here because I feel like the positivity side of things is something that you bring. I feel like there's there's elements that I've seen you whether it's been in, in in during the blue whale last year I've seen you and I've seen you interact and I've I've heard the things and and I feel like you're a a real big beacon of good. Thank you thank you so much for saying that. Do you I, really try? I mean is that something that you really try to like you know what let's be the positive force here? I think I have focused on that a lot and I think the people that do 
are able to like get away from those pitfalls. I think where it's like you, you come online and you're, you're railing to get something, but it's really like there's a problem in your relationship or there's a problem at your job and it's coming out in different ways. Or it's just like, you've got a lot of anger and resentment and, and bitterness and stuff like that. And it's just kind of like, you know, and you, you're just, maybe nobody said something about this or you're piling on with other people where it's like, Oh, this is a good opportunity. Like I also hate this thing, you know? And it's like, if you're not focused on the idea that like complaining ain't, isn't great and hating isn't great. It's like you lose track of, I think the, the you need to focus on getting away from that. You sure. know? And I think I've spent a lot of time focusing on like, what, what can I do that's good or what could be positive or how can we look at this from another angle mm. kind of a thing. Can you give me an example of that? I think even when things are bad, there, there's a, there's a silver lining to it, you know? So I think if you get, if you train your brain to start looking for silver linings and everything, it will eventually just start doing it on its own because mm. you've just through habit. Right. You know, right, so I think right. that that's happened to me in a lot of ways where it's like I can't look at something as just like everything's bad because I'm going to try really hard to find the good thing in it. Right. Right. What are you excited about in Tulsa? Like what are things popping off? You're like, oh, man, this is this is really exciting to me or or this is happening uh, that I'm really excited about. This might be kind of a cheesy answer, but I've kind of gotten away from like getting excited about things that aren't here yet because I, I I think I realized that for me anyway when I was kind of at my most depressed I remember having this weird moment where I was like looking forward to my birthday like three months from now and I was like that can't be good it's like I've already given up on like the three months in between here so it's like I've always kind of focused on like the day mm. so like I heard in the moment like I'm doing this right now obviously this is fucking great and uh, later, you know, I'm going to a, a movie at Circle Cinema, which is a sporting local theater. We're seeing that movie like Cuckoo or something or okay. like something like that. And I'm um, probably going to get some dinner before. I don't know what I'm going to get, but probably something local. And I mean, I think I think today, today matters, you know. So you, would you say you're a planner? I mean, I've got a I've got a calendar. I finally got a calendar. <laughs> I, got, I got a calendar. I mean, would, I mean, are you planning? Because it sounds like and which it speaks to me which speaks yeah. to me a lot. It sounds like you're the type of person that is in the now. You were just talking about like the today, appreciating the things of today. But also contradictory to that is these people that over plan, they over pack their schedule with all this stuff. And I think there's a good middle ground here. So sorry, I interrupted. Are you, or would you say you're, you're, you're a planner? Well, I, for so long, I was able to just kind of keep everything in my head, which is insane. Like I was just like remembering everything. And then my, my partner was like, you got to start writing this stuff down. And it did get to a point where like I spaced on a few things, which it's still like, just, I couldn't believe that it right. happened. Right. You know, someone hit me up about it. I was supposed to do a little spot on some show and they were like, all right, you know, where are you at? And it was like eight Oh three or something. And I was like in bed and I was like, that's never happened to me. I'm always like. Gotta show, gotta show Wednesday, gotta show Thursday, gotta yeah. show, I know where I'm supposed to be. And so I started keeping a calendar, which is really, really helped. But I have shows Wednesday, Thursday, two shows Friday, and a show Saturday. I do know that for sure. So this week. Because I've looked at so it. So you, you, yeah. you are you are stacked. D yeah. Local shows? Yeah, I have a show at Wednesday. I'm going to be at uh, the Boxyard, American Slayer on Thursday. Friday, I'm going to be at Belafonte and Rabbit Hole, and I'm going to be at heirloom rust scales on saturday dude you're <laughs> it's crazy yeah this is awesome i mean this is what you want right right it's just right. be doing and going and dude that's so exciting earlier you mentioned uh, a, a local spot here in the heights uh this is the second time someone has mentioned this place prism cafe prism cafe why why <laughs> is this such a tulsa hidden gem it's funny because I met Amy at Sound Pony. Uh, she's the the head chef and owner and everything like that. And, you know, I live in the neighborhood. It was kind of coincidental that she was talking about getting that restaurant there. Someone else told me maybe even before she did where they were like, yeah, a restaurant's going in there. And I was like, oh, it'll be great because it was Fulton Street across the street, which is now in, in Greenwood. But um, I never had an idea that it could be as good as it is. Like, I mean, you know, stuff food places open all the time and you're like okay that's a good burger that's yeah. a good, good tacos or whatever but it's like it really is next level food which is crazy because i didn't know her backstory that she was a chef on the east coast and a chef on the west coast and it's like she's got all of these influences and she's been you know 
a, been a chef and been cooking forever. Right. So it's just phenomenal. And we started going there and then it was just like, it's so funny because we didn't plan to go there every day, <laughs> but it just started happening where it was like, how can we not go tomorrow? Yeah. You know, it's funny. We tried to go to, um, Queenie's today and there was a super long wait. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I, don't <laughs> know. I love Queenie's. Queenie's is amazing. I'm actually friends with, I'm friends with Brian that owns yeah. it. We have the same last name. I'm Evan Hughes. He's Brian Hughes, but we used to be able to go to Queenie's more until they opened up one 10 houses away from us, you know? So we started going to prism all the time. And Brian actually comes in and supports prism too. Oh, He's nice. eaten there a number of times, Yeah, uh, which is so great that like, um, like Elliot from McNally's has come and eaten there. Like so many people that are like chefs and business owners around town have come to get a sandwich and, it's just a cool Tulsa place. And there's the Evan sandwich, which you didn't ask me about yet, but I'm going to plug, let's, let's plug it right anyway. I got, I got my own sandwich. <laughs> you have arrived, sir. I've arrived, yeah. I did ask if I could have my own sandwich. Did you was, really? And they're yeah, like, yeah. Uh. kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. We're talking local here. You mentioned Circle Cinema. You mentioned having food. and that, Like, why is local so important to you? Like, why is, why is that meaningful? Sounds like you might even, like, certain times you might seek it out of like, let's go local, local food, local entertainment. Why is that important? I think I realized like, I mean, one thing that's important about it, I think is that the, the people need you where it's sort of like, does Luke Bryan need you at his concert? You know, like, is he going to notice if you're not there? Your Got friend it. probably will notice if you're not there. I mean, that's, that's just a thing where it's like prism cafe needs our support. You know, um, Chick-fil-A doesn't necessarily need our support, not throwing any shade. It's just like they've got a line out the door regardless. It's right. like their their pocket isn't going to notice right. um, your money. But also, you know, there's an energy exchange, too, I think, with like um, I, I've, I've told people a long time ago, you know, if you start if you start following a local band and you go to all their shows, they might not meet you until they see you at like the seventh one. But eventually it's like they're going to be like, hey we got to find out who this guy is. It's been coming to like all of our shows. There's kind of a, there really is an appreciation there and a curiosity there and like a, an energy reciprocation, as, especially in a place like Tulsa. I think we're like the local artists want to return the energy that locals are giving them. You know, if someone comes to like a bunch of my comedy shows, like I remember that forever. Right. I could tell you who I've seen over and over and over again. And I feel like I owe them, you know? And it's like, Maybe you had some people be like, oh, no, you know, they, they, whatever. But like, I, I genuinely do, you know, because it's like you supported me and I need to support you. And right. if you're opening your own like knitting store uh, selling yarn and stuff, I need to go and buy some yarn because you've bought my comedy. Right. Right. You know? Support. Yeah. Support. It's, it's circular. It's circular. I, I love it. I love it. We've really touched on a lot of things today of, of Tulsa centric very Tulsa. I definitely going into this interview and, and wanting to talk to you. I definitely felt like you're a Tulsa icon in a way <laughs> and, and just a part of the fabric of, of the city. And obviously I have a lot of love for this place. Um, and this was just a, a, a fun time to sit down and, and chat. Was there anything last minute that you wanted to discuss? Anything to throw out there? No, I, I, I love that you came and did this, man. I love what you're doing. I think it's so cool. I'm so glad that you're doing this. And um, this is fantastic. Thank you, man. Thank you, Evan. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. And everybody go to Welltown. <laughs> <laughs>